most antenna designs start with a dipole. But based on the problem that you're trying to solve, you will end up with one of these specific implementations. Today, I will be looking at the topic of connecting the dipole to a transmission line, while still keeping the dipole in a vertical position. Hello and welcome back. Today, I want to continue looking at specific antenna implementations by analyzing the sleeve dipole. A structure which to the untrained eye looks like a monopole, but once you look into the details, you will realize this is a dipole. I will be looking at the theoretical aspects of the structure and then look at the results I got for the practical build. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. Let's start off by first looking at the problem that we're trying to solve. So any dipole used for RF transmission or reception needs to be connected using a transmission line. So far nothing special. Now, if the dipole is placed horizontally above a ground surface, you can simply put the transmission line in a vertical position and this will not have an impact on the antenna performance. With the setup, you get the radiation pattern that you expect, when also considering the ground impact. But now, if we require a vertically polarized antenna, well, usually the transmission line will come out at a right angle, but then you still need to take it down to the RF equipment. So why is this an issue? To better understand this, let's take a look at the radiation pattern of a dipole built inside of a antenna simulator. So first off, a standalone dipole, we can check its impedance, and then if we look at the far field plots, so just create a 3D render, we can see that it is a donut shape. So the antenna is said to be omnidirectional in the plane perpendicular to the antenna. In this case, the antenna is constructed along the z-axis and the radiation pattern is uniform in the xy plane. Now, if we include a structure perpendicular to the antenna, placed right in the center, so our feed line, and we recheck, first of all the impedance and gain have stayed exactly the same, and if we recheck the radiation pattern, well, nothing really changed. The radiation pattern is still a donut as before. So this is why a dipole fed by a perpendicular transmission line is such a common constructive solution. It behaves just like the standalone dipole. Finally, if we add in a mast, so a line parallel to our initial dipole, something needed to mount our dipole in a vertical position, and we re-simulate, well, the numbers are starting to change, you are getting a slightly different impedance, slightly different gain value, and if we check our radiation pattern, this starts to be different. It's not a uniform donut anymore. So, while you do need the mass to physically support the antenna, you can't really prevent the metallic support structure from interacting with the antenna fields. So this is the fundamental problem of such a structure. Sure, it provides support for your antenna, and you could even take advantage by turning the pole into a dedicated reflector, but the important thing to keep in mind is that building the dipole like this will not provide a true omnidirectional antenna. And this is where the sleeve comes into play. So the fundamental idea behind this type of antenna is that the feed line, rather than going from the middle perpendicularly outwards, you instead make at least one of the elements hollow and pass the transmission line through that. This way, the line is on the exact same alignment as the antenna, so with or without the transmission line or support structure's influence, you should be able to again get a uniform pattern distribution. Now, if we come back to the simulator and place a conductive element in a collinear orientation with our original dipole, so our support structure is below now, and we recalculate, we do see a small variation in our parameters compared to our original standalone dipole, and well, if we check the pattern, it's no longer a perfect donut, but it is uniform. So whatever the deformation that occurred, 
it's the same in all directions. So this is the big advantage of the sleeve dipole. You can mount it vertically and get a omnidirectional pattern, not just in theory, but also with a practical build. So that is the basic idea behind the sleeve dipole. One of the antenna elements goes over the feed line like a sleeve. Now, before going any further, let's discuss how such an antenna should be designed. How do you get from a target frequency to some physical dimensions? Now, most explanations that I found start by saying that the two arms need to be of equal length, equal to a quarter wavelength at the target frequency. So at the end of the day, this thing is still a dipole. And usually there is a mention of a set of ferrites on the feed line, either inside of the sleeve or also extending out onto the feed line. The idea here is to prevent the field lines from the top radiator closing onto the feed line but also to decouple the support structure from the antenna. One further advantage of this technique is that it makes the dipole unbalanced, so you no longer need a dedicated balen when feeding it. Now, starting from this basic structure, there are a few things to mention. First, the physical radiator lengths are not the same as the electrical lengths. The physical length is usually a bit smaller. But another thing to consider, is that the conductor diameter also impacts the needed length. Thicker radials are made shorter. So if the two dipole elements are of different diameter, they will also be of different length. And it's worth noting that this small detail also changes the feed impedance. So while a dipole built from equal diameter rods, 6 mm in this case, has a resident impedance of around 70.5 ohms, once we change the diameter, so make one rod much thicker, 20 millimeters in diameter, and also compensate for the length, so make it a bit shorter, and we recalculate, we can see that the resident impedance has dropped to around 69 ohms, so 1.5 ohms smaller than before. And well, if we make both of the arms of the same diameter, so both of them are now 20 millimeters, and we recalculate, well, the impedance has dropped even more. Now, this of course can be made more substantial by having larger diameters. So the point is that by leveraging this property, making the arms of larger diameter, we can make the structure, which while still being a dipole, can have a lower and lower impedance, potentially pushing it down to 50 ohms. So taking all of these findings into play, I decided to try and first design such an antenna using the antenna simulator, and then build it, somehow. To make the construction relatively compact, I decided to go for an ADS-B antenna, so something with a center frequency of 1.09 GHz. After playing around with the numbers a bit, this is what I ended up with. An antenna that has a top side element, 6.5 cm long, 3 mm in diameter, so this could be built from a piece of wire. And then for the bottom half, a 5 cm long element, 18 mm in diameter. So this could be built from an old piece of pipe. And while all of this is placed a few centimeters away from the support pole. So if we check the 3D view, this is what it all looks like. We have the antenna and then the support pole below it. Now, if we run the numbers, we can see that this thing is almost resonant at our target frequency and has an impedance very close to 50 ohms. I decided not to play around with the numbers anymore since the practical build will have quite a bit of tolerance anyway. Finally, if we check the radiation pattern, while it is omnidirectional, it's still strongly impacted by the support pole. So we are not getting our perfect donut but rather whatever you call this thing. To actually build it, I printed some 3D supports from ASA plastic. This should have low dielectric loss, and well, it is a bit flimsy, but it works. Also, on the bottom, I added a bunch of clip-on ferrites. So there are two visible, and the third one inside of the tube. One idea with this build was that you can also slide a cap over it so it can be made weather and pigeon proof. So this is what the whole thing looks like 
fully assembled. Just to check the behavior, I first connected it to a VNA to verify the impedance and standing wave ratio, so this seems to have a very decent and wideband SWR, about 100 to 200 megahertz. This seems quite nice, especially when we compare it to a ground plane antenna. So here we can see the two measurements overlapped. And well, for the exact impedance measurements, I did add some electronic delay to compensate for the connector to feed point transmission line length, though I'm not really convinced of the exact accuracy here. Anyway, it does seem to be relatively close to 50 ohms, though slightly lower. I guess compared to the simulation, the added plastic has a non-negligible impact. So to finish testing, I connected this to an SDR play device, put it up somewhere on the side of a building, activated the built-in ADSB plugin, and started listening. So while it should be no surprise that it does receive ADSB signals, it still seems to be working quite well, since the furthest aircraft that I can pick up is around 200 nautical miles or 370 kilometers away, which is pretty decent for the range that I should be getting. And maybe it's worthwhile mentioning that I did not use any sort of filters or amplifiers, it's just the antenna directly connected to the device. In the end, the sleeve dipole is a creative solution to the problem of feeding a vertical antenna. You can of course use this technique for a horizontal antenna as well, though that is not so common. It is however an interesting and relatively simple build, so if you like building your own antennas, you should not have a lot of issues with this one. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.